bonus week. Um, we're going to get an extra week because last week as we were going through, as I was going through my studies with it, I just ran across something in one of the prophecies. I thought, that's really fascinating. That's interesting. And, and so um, I just thought it was worth sharing because uh, it might give us some more insight into Judas, but it definitely gives us some insight into our own lives and some important things for us to learn. And so um, the question that came to my mind was, how could, how could a guy who was so... Um, loved by the Lord and treated so kindly by the Lord and uh, who was so trusted um, by the Lord, how could he turn and, and betray him so ruthlessly? Um, and, you know, we, I, I thought, well, I wonder if the Lord really did trust him. I mean, he obviously knew the hearts of all men, Scripture says. He, it says he entrusted himself to it says that when he, they saw the miracles, many people believed in him, but the Lord did not entrust himself to them because he knew the hearts of all men. But he did obviously entrust himself. That was talking about those who were coming to him because of the miracles. But he did entrust himself to his disciples. He shared secrets of his heart with them and, and confided in them, you might say. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, I wonder, did he really trust um, Judas? But if we're to believe that prophecy in Psalm 41 about the one who I've shared my bread with his turn, then he did trust him. We're, we'll read that in just a minute, and you'll see that Jesus did tr entrust himself to Judas. And, um, and the other disciples obviously trusted him. Uh, so how could a guy that was, had been so well received and accepted, and how could he then turn and just like almost overnight become a betrayer like that? And uh, I think we see some of the... Um, some of the answer in Psalm 41, obviously your initial answer will depend upon your theological framework, as I mentioned last week. And of course, what I mean by that is, how do you view God? How do you view man? How do you view the Bible? How, how do you view things like that? Because there are different ways that different Christians view things differently. And so somebody might say, well, it was prophesied that he was going to do it. And so, so Judas was predestined to do this. He had no choice in the matter. I have a little problem with that for several reasons. I could go into a whole bunch of reasons, but just real briefly, if, if that was prophesied that he would do that, you kind of get into a little conundrum, as I mentioned last week. It's like, well, then it was God's will that he do that, and so Judas was fulfilling God's will when he betrayed the Lord, and um, so therefore he's being condemned for, for uh, fulfilling God's will. That's a little weird. And then secondly... Um, if uh, he was predestined to do it, how can you judge a man as guilty of something that he had no choice in the matter of? That's a little weird, too. So I appreciate those who would say that was the reason because he's predestined. But I'll think that prophecy is more not a matter of God saying, this is what I determine will happen. But it's that he already knows what's going to happen. Omniscient, knows all things. And he just tells us what's going to happen. Not that he then causes it to happen. It's like, it's like uh, as a parent... If you put your two or three of your kids into a room and there's a cookie out there and you tell them not to eat the cookie, you can, you can pretty well prophesy this one will, this one won't, you know, and it'll be about three minutes or 30 seconds until this one does, you know, but that doesn't mean you caused it to happen, right? You just happen to know that kid, you know, well, God's knowing is much more thorough than ours. So, so I appreciate those who may think that's the reason, but I, I don't think that's the reason that he was predestined to and so he had no choice in the matter. I think he had a choice in the matter. In fact, maybe another reason he might have done it, we talked about too, is maybe he actually expected that Jesus was, this was going to prompt Jesus to go ahead and do what he was going to do, to be the Messiah, to deliver them from Roman oppression. And so Jesus is just a little slow in the matter, so I'm going to kind of, I'm going to provoke him to love and good works, as it says in Hebrews, which wasn't written yet, so he couldn't have been using that one. But, but I'm just going to encourage Jesus to get this going, because it does say that when he found out he'd been condemned, he was overcome with remorse. Well, what did he think was going to happen? Interesting, huh? Of course, some of that being blinded just by the God of this world, when Satan starts working in you and you open your heart to allow him to work, you do become kind of blinded. And all of a sudden, when things fall apart, you go, duh, what was I thinking? You know, you ever been there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, see ya, everybody. So we don't really know, but I, I think we might see a third possibility here in Psalm 41 which is one of the prophecies, there were others, one of the prophecies about the betrayal that Jesus was going to suffer at the hands of one who loved him. And, um, and so if, even if we don't see any insight into Judas, like I said, we're going to see some insight into our own hearts about a crucial matter that we need to be warned about. And uh, twice in the New Testament it says that the Old Testament stories were given to us as warnings. Th these stories were written down as warnings to us. And then, of course, in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 it says, All Scripture 
is given by inspiration of God's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, so this was written down not just to tell us what happened, but it's beneficial to us for our lives today, right here where we are. So let's see if we can kind of figure that out by digging a little deeper into that. And um, I think perhaps we'll get a little insight into Judas when we see in John 12, it, talks, it tells that story about where Mary came and anointed him with the expensive perfume. You remember that story? And uh, Judas then says, in John it tells us that Judas says, why was this not sold? We could have given it to the poor. And then it goes on to say that Judas didn't really care about the poor, but that he was stealing from the purse. And in a sense, he was also stealing from the poor. And he knew that because obviously if they give some of that to the poor, then he knows if he's taken it. He's not only stealing from the brothers, his band of brothers there, but he's stealing from the poor. And so we see that something was already seething in Judas's heart. Something was already happening in Judas's heart before that happened. And then Jesus rebukes him publicly. He said he rebukes Judas publicly for that. And so that's hard to take. And in Matthew 26, where it tells that same story, right after that, it says, right after that, then Judas went to the priests and made arrangements about how he could betray the Lord. So I look at that, and the, the connection could be something was already at work in his heart, and that may have just sort of pushed him over the edge, that offense that Jesus rebuked him publicly. You ever been rebuked publicly? Hurts, doesn't it? It's hard enough to be rebuked privately, but when it's in front of, when it's in front of the, the, you, you know, your, your tribe, your gang, your people, it hurts even more, doesn't it? So maybe that's what um, drove him over the edge. But I thought about it, and I thought, man, if there was anybody in that case that should have uh, betrayed Jesus, it would have been Peter. Peter was rebuked a lot more regularly, and he was rebuked a lot more severely. Get thee behind me, Satan. Whoa, you know? And so the thing I see from that is that offenses are going to come. Offenses are inevitable, but resentment is optional. Offenses are going to come our way. Jesus promised that. That's one of his promises you never find in the promise box. Offenses will come. You know, you never pull that one out to start off your morning with. Offenses will come. But how we handle those is our decision. They can either, we can either get bitter or we can get better. Because when we respond properly with forgiveness, we get better. We actually are representing the Lord. We're actually behaving as He behaves when we're offended and we respond with forgiveness. Especially when the person doesn't deserve to be forgiven. I think two of the times that Christians are most like their father is when they're giving and when they're forgiving. We're never more like God than when we're giving and when we're forgiving, especially if we're giving to those who don't deserve it and if we're forgiving those who don't deserve it. Because God doesn't decide whether a person is worthy before he gives to them. It says the sun, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Now you can look at that as bad things. Yeah, that's true. But if you're a farmer, that's a good thing. And the rain comes to the good farmer. The rain comes to the farmer that curses God. So God is a generous God in giving and in forgiving. And, and we're just we're like him. So when offenses come, it's an opportunity for us to be like God and extend forgiveness. And we're more, even more like him when that person doesn't deserve it. So <clears throat> uh, Peter had reason to be offended but obviously responded in forgiveness. And his was, where else am I going to go, Lord? You're, you've got the words of eternal life. But it appears that Judas responded with unforgiveness. And, and we're going to see a little more on that too. Because as we see this parallel of Psalm 41, we're going to see that it carries out more than just the idea of the bread. Well, let's read Psalm 41. Because this is, this is written by David. And we, it, it's about a betrayer in his midst, and we believe this is the story that he, uh, about Ahithophel. He was referring to this man called Ahithophel. We'll see who he is a little bit later. So in David's life, that's who he's talking about. But then later, this is applied to Jesus and Judas. <clears throat> and, uh, Psalm 41, verse 5, and these, these scriptures are in your notes there, so you can just check those out. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? That was the plan. We're going we're gonna to put into this guy, put him in a grave. Everybody will forget all about him. Verse 9, and this is the one that's referred to, even my close friend, someone I trusted. Now, David trusted Ahithophel, but 
if we follow this out, it would seem that Jesus actually trusted Judas. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, and that's where it's referred to when he gave him the bread. That was to fulfill this prophecy here. One who shared my bread has turned against me. And so clearly this is speaking of, of Judas, and we're told that in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, I think if we follow what this is referring to, we're going to see a little insight into Judas as well. And this is the story of Ahithophel. This is, uh, so who, who was Ahithophel? In 2 Samuel, something is happening where David's son, Absalom, many of you are familiar with this story, but I'll, I'll just go over it briefly in case you've forgotten some of the details. David's son, Absalom, <clears throat> is rising up against his father. And a lot of this has to do with, it goes way back to uh, one of David's sons violated one of David's daughters, his half-sister, and David did nothing about it. And Absalom, who was the sister's full brother, He's really irritated over this. In fact, Absalom, I, I, my heart goes out to Absalom. I kind of like that guy. Because when his sister was violated, he, he comforted her. So he was the kind of a guy that the sister felt she could go to for comfort. And he then says, dear sister, come into my own house. I'll take care of you. Because, of course, now she's not going to be able to get married. She's, she's been raped by her half-brother. There's nobody going to have her as a wife. So he, he, he takes care of his sister and goes, that's it pretty good guy, you know? And uh, then David does nothing about it. David does nothing about it. And again, Absalom, one of his weaknesses was he was not a forgiver. And so he, uh, he plans and strategizes, and sometime later, he kills that brother who violated his sister, which actually all he was doing was carrying out what the law demanded for a rapist. So again, you kind of go, wow, Absalom, you know, <laughs> probably not a good choice, but you can imagine his frustration. My dad is doing nothing about this. And so he kills his brother. Well, then he flees from his dad and everything falls apart there. David doesn't forgive Absalom. Absalom still ticked with his father. It's just, it, it just goes downhill from there. And so we see David, though he was a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament, he certainly was not a perfect picture. He was a very, very flawed man, a horrible father. You see other situations, too, where he was just a terrible father, a terrible father. And so he, um, he, he, he uh, doesn't forgive Absalom. Absalom doesn't forgive him. So long and short of it is this seething anger continues to grow. And how wonderful it would have been. This whole mess could have been ended if David would have just gone back and said, Son, you know, let's, we need to forgive one another. Let's get this right. Just brought him under his wing and loved him because that's what Absalom wanted. And David wanted to do it too, but why didn't he? Uh, I guess us guys can kind of understand. Remember the old happy days when Fonz would go have to apologize? I'm so, I'm so, I'm, I'm so. He just, just couldn't say sorry, you know? Just couldn't get it out, you know? It's just, so, it's, so for whatever reason, he just couldn't apologize and humble himself to Absalom. Dads, it's so important we humble ourselves in front of our kids when we mess up. It really is. Uh, after all, <laughs> you're not telling them anything they don't know. You know, when you say, I messed up, you know, they're already aware of it. So anyway, but David didn't do that. Absalom didn't go to his father and say, Dad, you know, I, I took things into my own hands. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And so they end up at odds and, and a rebellion starts in Absalom's heart. And so he plans to take over the kingdom. And this plot gets around, and everybody knows because he's, he's starting to gather people behind him and win the hearts of Israel, it says. He's winning the people's hearts. And David's aware of this, and he, again, doesn't do anything to put a stop to it. And one of David's most trusted advisors was a man named Ahithophel, and that's where Ahithophel comes into the story. He was one of David's trusted advisors. In fact, he was a real patriot. And the reason I know he was a patriot is David had these 30 mighty men. It's amazing. You read the story. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, you read about David's mighty men. His, these were amazing warriors, fierce warriors. Who One of them would take down 30. One of them would take down 100. They were, they were fierce warriors. And um, they were like David's kind of SEAL Team 6, his personal bodyguard. These were the guys closest to him. And of those 30, two of those were related to Ahithophel. One was, one was Ahithophel's son. And one was Ahithophel's son-in-law. 
And so of these 30 men, almost 10%, two of them were related to Ahithophel. And, and that, the thing about that, too, is it's interesting to see you've got a, you've got a son and a son-in-law that were, were related to him. And so um, this man was a patriot. He was, he, and, and he was a wise counselor too. In fact, it, it says in 2 Samuel 16, in those days, the advice of, Ahith, of Ahithophel that he gave was like that of one who inquires of God. In other words, if you talk to Ahithophel, it's like going straight to the throne and getting wisdom from heaven. So he was a wise counselor. And it gave, so it means he also gave godly counsel. And so here's Ahithophel, this trusted man, and a rebellion is rising. And Absalom calls Ahithophel to come and talk with him. Now, if you're a trusted advisor like that, and you're uh, loyal to the king, what's your response going to be? I ain't no way I'm going over there. <laughs> no, I know what you're up to. Or maybe I'll go as a spy to come back and report to David. Well, the Ahithophel goes, which would be, what? Why would this trusted advisor go? And he does not report back to David. In fact, he sides with Absalom and Wow, that's kind of crazy. What happened here? How could this guy, a patriot, loyal, all of a sudden turn like that? Well, we'll read on with the story here. What happens now? David, um, Absalom is ready now to attack David, and David talks with all of his men, and, and they decide, you know, we don't want to defend ourselves here in Jerusalem. It's just it's, too many people will be killed, even if we win the battle. Let's just retreat. We'll just, for now, so David just, Hypes up, gets everybody together, and they evacuate the embassy. Basically, they leave the palace, they leave Jerusalem, and they, they just leave. And, but he leaves behind ten concubines um, to care for the palace, which a concubine is, we kind of think of it in our scenario, sort of as like prostitutes that just hang out with the king. But actually, they were like a, like a wife of a lower status. We don't have any... If anything, it'd be, almost be like a common law marriage here, you know. It's like she's a wife, she's special, but she's not that special. You know, we're not actually going to get the certificate, or you might say, okay. So, uh, I mean, that's my best <laughs> 21st century illustration of what a concubine is, okay. So, these were, these were special women, but not that special, okay. Uh, and so, he left him behind to uh, care for the palace. And he flees. And on the way out, he runs into people who are, um, you know, coming to join him. And he runs into this one guy called Hushai, and he says, oh, David, you know, Hushai is all dressed in mourning clothes, and he's throwing dust on his face to just mourning this day. Our king has been driven from the throne by this, by this upstart. And he says, David, I want to go with you. I'm with you. I'm behind you. And David says, well, you know, Hushai, if you really want to help me, here's what you could do. Instead of coming with me, you would be best if you would go back to the palace and Convince Absalom that you, like Ahithophel, have turned against me and be there and then give me reports. Go back as a spy. Give me reports on what's happening and try to confound the, the wisdom, the counsel of Ahithophel. And in fact, David prayed. It says that David prayed that God would confuse the counsel of Ahithophel. And so he sends Hushai at, back to perhaps help that along a little bit. And that's, think of that, that's a pretty brave guy to do that. Because if he can't convince Absalom that he's really turned against David, man, he's, he's dead right there on the spot. And so Hushai, great guy. There are all these really heroes that you don't know anything but their name in there. And we don't think about it because we just read over the story. But, but what a hero, what a loyal friend that's willing to risk his own life to go back and, and represent you there. So that's what happens. So Hushai goes back. Absalom takes over Jerusalem, takes over the palace. And then he comes to Hithophel. What do we do now? Okay, we've got the palace. We've got the stronghold. What do we do to put an end to this thing? And Hithophel says this, first of all. He says, well, first thing, we need to make sure that the people are behind you. And the way to let them know that, the, that, you, that you're serious about this. There's no way you're going to go back and make it up with your dad. You know, because they may be thinking, well, he makes peace. And who do, we, who do we side with? He says, here's what you do. You take those ten women. You go up on the palace roof where everybody knows what's happening. We'll put up some little tents, and you basically rape those women on the, on the rooftop. Now, you go, this is Ahithophel who getting counsel from him was like getting counsel from God. And you go, whoa, who, who, how could he come up with such an ungodly plan? 
But Absalom thinks this is a great idea, and he does that. And so it breaks really any possibility of restoration, and it gathers the people together behind Absalom now is what Ahithophel's plan was. And so he does that. And then, then he comes back, now what do I do, Ahithophel? And Ahithophel says this. Let's just, it's 2 Samuel um, 17, verses 1 and 2. Ahithophel said to Absalom, now let me choose 12,000 men. And I will arise and pursue David tonight. He doesn't just say, send your troops out after David. He says, I'll lead the troops. I'll lead the charge. I'll pick the guys. We want to pick the best guys. I'll pick the guys, and I myself will lead the charge. I will arise and pursue David tonight, right now, after him. I will come upon him while he is weary and tired. He's been walking all day. They've been gathering all their stuff together. They've been moving all this stuff. You know, after a day of moving, you're pretty tired, right? They're tired. They're weary. I'll catch him tonight, and I will um, make them afraid. I will, I will terrorize his troops, and all the people who are with him will flee, and I will kill him myself. I will strike the king. I'm only going to kill him. You go, man. This guy had something going on in his heart. He's not just uh, got this evil plan to treat these women so badly, but now he wants to be right there and put the sword in David himself. What happened to this guy who went from being this godly counselor, a loyal patriot, to one who's willing to, not only willing to just see the king killed, but he wants to be there and do it himself. What transpired? And this is, this is the guy David was writing about in Psalm 41 when he said, My enemies, when will he die and his name perish? Verse 7, Psalm 41, All my enemies whisper together against me. They're plotting these things. They imagine the worst for me. Even my close friend, this counselor, someone I trusted, he advised me for years. One who shared my bread has turned against me. Well, what happens? Well, you remember Hushai? Absalom says, hmm, okay, that's Ahithophel. Let's just see what Hushai has to say. And so they go to Hushai. And uh, he says this, hmm, you know, this time, I don't think Ahithophel's advice is so good. He says, you got to remember, your dad is an experienced warrior, and his men are fierce. I mean, they are fierce warriors. They're like lions, bears with their cubs stolen. You know, he says, you don't really want to go out right now. Because also, he's a king, he's a warrior, he's an experienced warrior. He's not going to be foolish enough to sleep with his, where his men are. He's going to be hidden somewhere away. And so if you come in and you attack tonight, you may rout them and they may flee, but everybody's going to hear David got away. And uh, then they may think, ooh, he may not be able to defeat David, and you're not going to get the people behind you. So what you need to do is, let's just... Let's establish your throne first. You're here. You're on the throne. Let's get all the people in the north of Israel, all the people in the south of Israel. Let's gather all the 12 tribes together behind you. Then when your throne is really secure and you know you've got everybody's heart, then we will go after him as a nation. There'll be no place he can hide. If he hides in a city, we'll all go into that city, tear the city down, and we'll get him then. But first, let's establish your throne. And because... Uh, it says, uh, 2 Samuel 17, the Lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel in order to bring disaster upon Absalom. And so even that good advice is turned down by Absalom. goes, that sounds a lot better to me. So he decides to follow Hushai's counsel instead and to wait. Well, you remember Judas, after listening to the enemy and after then betraying the Lord, and his eyes then were opened, and he realized, oh, what, 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 I've, what he'd done. He went out and hanged himself, right? It's kind of interesting. I got to think about this. I thought, well, you know, Absalom, if you know the story, Absalom is routed. Absalom's troops are run. And Absalom is riding, and he's going through a thick forest. He had long, flowing hair. And uh, his hair got caught in a tree, and he got hung up in the tree. And so Absalom kind of died by hanging as well. Uh, because what happened is David's troops came upon him. Joab, the leader of David's troops, came upon him, and they were able to kill him because he's hanging helplessly in a tree. So, so Judas hangs himself. Absalom dies by hanging, you might say. 
But Ahithophel, what happened to Ahithophel? Ahithophel, too, realizes that he's not being listened to, and he realizes this plan of Hushai's is not going to work, that David will gather his forces, and, and he will come back and defeat. So in 2 Samuel, it says what Ahithophel did. When Ahithophel saw, 2 Samuel 17, 23, when Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, listen to this, he saddled his donkey, he set out for his house in his hometown, he put his house in order, and he hanged himself. Whoa, pretty, pretty uh, radical, wouldn't you say? But I thought, how interesting that Judas, this, this prophecy about Psalm 41 goes deeper than just the fact that they shared the bread. The betrayers both went out and hanged themselves. That's interesting, because you don't see many hangings in the Old Testament, particularly by suicide, or in the Bible. You, it just wasn't a way they killed themselves. And so it's interesting, you see that parallel go even deeper. They have the same fate. But what caused Ahithophel to be this traitor? Why would he do? What, what, what caused that to happen? We looked at Judas, and perhaps it was an offense in his heart there. Um, well, remember that I said that David's um, mighty men, that two of them were related to Ahithophel? Um, one was a son, and one was a, was a uh, son-in-law. In 2 Samuel 23, 34, it gives us the name of that son, because it lists David's 30 mighty men there, and it says, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite. So we know now that that 30 mighty men that <laughs> Ahithophel, forgot his name, Ahithophel's son was Eliam. Well, that doesn't help a whole lot, does it? Until you get to 2 Samuel 11 with David's encounter with Bathsheba. And look what it says here. One evening David got up, 2 Samuel 11, 2, one evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. Which, by the way, David had no business being there. 2 Samuel 11, 1 says, This was the springtime when kings went off to war. David is supposed to be out in the battlefield with his troops. And um, he stayed at home. Because the battle they were going to fight that time, they'd almost won it in the fall, but then winter came, and so they kind of retreated. It's going to be an easy one. And so he just stays home. And, I, I, you know, it's, it's funny. When, you, when you're not where you belong, you get into all kinds of trouble, doesn't you? Don't you? You know? Um, and that's what happened here. He just had no business being where he was. And so he's up on the rooftop. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out, who is she? And the man said, she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, uh, and the wife of Uriah. Those are the two mighty men, Eliam and Uriah. Bathsheba was Ahithophel's granddaughter. David destroyed Ahithophel's family. He had his son-in-law, killed, set up, murdered, basically. As you remember how, how uh, and this is another guy I want to meet in heaven, Uriah the Hittite. Man, what a faithful friend. He, he, David gave horrible orders, and yet Uriah, whatever it takes, I'm going to carry him out. He told him, he said, go to the front where the battle's the fiercest. Put our Uriah right out in front. You go, this isn't the part of the wall we attack. <laughs> this, isn't, this is the stronghold. He, but he follows the orders. And he goes out, and then when Uriah's out there, withdraw from him. So David basically had him killed by the enemy. And so Ahithophel's son-in-law was murdered. His, um, Ahithophel's granddaughter was basically taken advantage of and raped by David. You know, he was not married to her. He had no business messing with her. And... Um, and you can imagine what that did to Eliam, too, the father. Now, apparently, maybe Eliam was able to forgive. We don't really know. We don't, it never says Eliam left the 30 mighty men. And if, if he did not, then he would have been fighting against um, Absalom if Eliam would have stayed loyal. to. So maybe Eliam was able to forgive. We don't know. But we do know Ahithophel carried that in his heart. And here's the crazy thing about it. You know, you can kind of kind of sympathize with Ahithophel. What he did was wrong, but David destroyed his family and never even apologized for it. 
Psalm 51 is a psalm that David wrote after his thing with Bathsheba, where he's, he's a, where he's talking about the sin and how great it was. In Psalm 51, he, it's a song of repentance after Nathan the prophet confronted him about the thing with Bathsheba. But there was always a verse in there that really troubled me. It says this, verse 4 in Psalm 51. He's praying and he's saying, Against you and you only have I sinned, and I've done what's evil in your sight. I remember hearing a pastor one time, he, was, he preached on that, and he was saying that, yes, you have to see, we have to understand when we sin, it's only against God that we sin. And I thought, I don't think so. And he was trying to make David this wonderful, righteous guy who never did anything wrong, but I'm thinking, no, I think he sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba, Eliam, Ahithophel. <laughs> when we sin, it's not just against God. Because if it's just against God, you can do like David and just go, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. And you've got a wake of people around you that are in pain and hurting because you have destroyed them. But I don't have to go and apologize to them. It's, I, I, I'm, I'm, it's easier, right, to apologize to the Lord and confess than it is to humble ourselves and go to people many times. And David, as wonderful of a man as he was, a great, as a, a, great a warrior, a type of Christ, he just found it hard to apologize to people. And so in his, even in his prayer of repentance, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. No, he didn't go to Absalom and apologize. He didn't go to Tamar, the girl that was violated by his son. Didn't go to her. He didn't go to, uh, he didn't go to Ahithophel. He didn't go to Eliam. Couldn't go to Uriah. He'd killed him. And so I just see from this how crucial it is, how important it is that we learn to forgive and to be forgiven, to go and apologize to others as well, to cleanse our heart of forgiveness, but also to confess when we've, when we've done wrong. See, Ahithophel somehow allowed a root of bitterness to grow in his heart, and this brought his destruction and destruction of many around him as well. And Hebrews, we'll close with this. Hebrews 12 says this. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Wow, did you know that was in? Somebody told me that one time, and I said, that's not in the New Testament. <laughs> they grabbed my Bible and highlighted it. You know, the, Don't write in my Bible. You know? I told you it was in there. You're right, it's in there. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14, and then verse 15. See to it, and I think this is connected. Obviously, they're, they're connected. See to it, part of that holiness is see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. How do you fall short of the grace of God? And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. A bitter root. That is what had happened in Ahithophel's life. A root had come down. And why does it call it a bitter root? instead of a bitter seed. I've, I sometimes refer to the, a seed of bitterness or a seed. Well, a root starts out as a seed, right? But a bitter root. A root. What is the root? The root is the foundation of the plant. It's the thing that holds it up. It's the thing that goes down into the earth and, and anchors itself and entwines itself into other things in the dirt to hold it strong. And that's what bitterness does. It entwines itself in our heart to hold on to that hurt to where it's harder and harder and harder. The stronger that root is, the harder it is to pull out that tree or to pull out that weed or that bush. The stronger that root is. And, and bitterness is the same way. It just goes down. It, it gets into our heart to where it's hard to pull it out. And that's why we need to be quick to repent, quick to forgive, and quick to repent as well and ask for forgiveness of others. So it, it anchors itself. In other words, you can get locked into where you just can't move forward because you're locked into that hurt and you just can't move forward. It takes a, it takes a great surgery to cut that root out. Now, no matter how deep the root is, you can eventually cut it off. But it might hurt more if you wait longer. And so it, a, a root anchors it. The root is where the, uh, the tree or the bush or the plant or whatever gets its nourishment too, draws it up from the ground. And, and as we, if we hold on to that bitterness, it, that root will just begin to nourish that hurt and that hurt grows stronger and healthier, well, unhealthier, because a hurt, nourishing a hurt is never healthy. But it grows stronger and more possessive of our life. And then finally, 
a, a, a root, and maybe there are other il il illustrations you can think of, but a root, it's, it's underground. You don't see the root. And many people can hide their bitterness very well. In fact, you know, I've never run into somebody that says, I'm really bitter about that. <laughs> never. Have you ever run into anybody that says, yeah, I'm really bitter? <laughs> they they say, but, but I'll bet you've run into people that you know they're bitter, yeah. right? Oh, that's a bitter person. And many times it, it etches itself on your face. Yeah. You can tell just by looking at it, that is a bitter person. You know, they, they, they've really been hurt and they haven't been able to just release it and let it go. They're just bitter. But nobody ever says they're bitter. It's that part that's hidden underground. But I tell you what, when you see the fruit, you know there's a root, right? And when, when you see that bitterness you, you, that, that manifests itself, maybe they're just always snappy, always snarky, always upset about something, you know? When you see the fruit, you know there's a root. And it's just so important. And what causes that? It says, don't fall short of the grace of God. What is falling short of the grace of God? Well, I think it, it realized that when we don't forgive, this is a scary thought, but I didn't make it up. Jesus said it. I, I kind of wish he hadn't have because I don't like this particular little story. He says, if you don't forgive, neither will you be forgiven. That kind of rattles my theological cage. You know, well, I thought, I thought forgiveness wasn't anything we had to do to earn it. It was just a total free gift of God. Well, it is a gift of God. But James says, if you, if you, if you have faith, then show it by doing something. Show me your faith. And one of those things is by forgiving others. Wow. So we fall short of the grace of God when we don't realize the grace that we've been given and therefore we don't give full grace to other people. Wow. When I recognize my own sin, when I've been hurt or I've been offended or something like that, all I have to do is look at myself and go, oh man, <laughs> that's nothing compared to what I've done to the Lord because I'm the one responsible for the nails in his hands, this pierce in his side. The reason he died was for my sin, for your sin. And so until I've been nailed to the cross, thorns in the crown, beaten beyond recognition. Pfft, nothing has happened to me compared to what my sin did to someone else. And so don't fall short of the grace of God and don't let that bitter root. So it's just so important that we learn not only to forgive, but to repent and confess early. Because it's not enough just to go to the Lord when you've hurt other people. And it's not enough just to go to the Lord and say, oh, against you and you only have I sinned. No. <laughs> and, I, and I got a feeling if you really go to him with that heart, he's going to say, he's going to say, if your brother has aught against you, don't be bringing your gift to the altar, but you first. Hmm, somebody said this, didn't they? But you go first, make it right with them. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said, not if you have aught against your brother, but if he has aught against you, you don't be... Don't be coming doing this all spiritual thing. Oh, I'm bringing my gift to the altar. He says, you go make it right with him. That's more important to me than whatever gift you bring. That's the greatest gift you can bring to the altar is you go make it right with your brother. And think about that from a dad's perspective. If your kids are fighting and fussing and they come to you and, oh, daddy, what can we do to make you happy? Just get along with one another. Right? Isn't that one of the greatest things? John said that. He says, my greatest joy is that my children, speaking about the church, my greatest joy is that my children just love one another. You get along with one another. And that's the greatest joy we can bring, is just clear our heart of any bitter root, any unforgiveness, confess any that we've hurt, even if, well, they deserved it, or, well, they shouldn't have gotten hurt over that. What's it matter? They did. It doesn't matter if they should have or shouldn't have. Well, we got a bunch of snowflakes. Well, so what? <laughs> You can go and, and, and apologize that you melted the snowflake, right? I'm really sorry. That hurt you, you wimp. No. <laughs> Keep that to yourself, okay? All right. Well, the point is we've got to be quick to forgive and quick to ask forgiveness because we are going. Offenses will come, and sometimes you're going to be the instrument of them. So it is going to happen, so we need to learn to forgive and be forgiven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and thank you for the forgiveness that we enjoy. And because we enjoy it so liberally and so undeservedly from you, Lord, oh, it's just not, the only just thing is for us to give it liberally, even to those who don't deserve it. So I ask you, Lord, that you would help us to be men and women of forgiveness, men and women with a clean heart, 
men and women who do not hold on to offenses, but just quickly let them be washed away in the flow of your forgiveness and the flow of the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us. And you said, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, then you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, may we be um, regular confessors of the things we do wrong. And may we be those who forgive others who wrong us as well, Father. We want to please you. We want to uh, bring a smile to your face. And so we know that's one of the ways we can do that, to be generous in giving and generous in forgiving, even to those who do not deserve it, because that's how you are. That's our Heavenly Father. And we want to be like you here on this earth. We love you. We bless you. Thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.